folks, thank you so much for braving the heat and being enjoying the cool and joining us today. So my name is Emily. I'm a librarian here at the Ann Arbor District Library, and I am so glad to be here with you today to learn about Detroit history. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker, Paul Pashan. Look over there and see. Paul is a freelance writer, he's an author, a Detroit area historian, so you are being a great companion to learn from him today. If anyone needs any hearing assistance, we do have devices at the back of the room. But you give us a wave and we can hand one over to you. Um, or if you have anything else you need, I'll be here. But meanwhile, I know you aren't here to see me talk. This is Paul Talk. So I'll hand it over to him. Thanks, Paul. I know the microphone is right here, but if I were to not use it, the stand right here. Oh. Very good. Um, this is okay. I'll just manage with this. Okay. Is this, um, am I recording sufficiently right now? Fantastic. Okay. Well, that said, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out on what is not the most hospitable day in terms of the weather forecast. So. Um, as Emily said, my name is Paul. Um, I, um, just a little bit about myself before I get started. I entered um, uh, the world of writing and research about oh, 14 years ago now. Uh, I had previously worked in a completely unrelated field. I worked in the retail industry for about 20 years. And if you remember when that big recession hit around 2008, uh, I got laid off from the last place I worked and that kind of forced me to get a new career, and this is something I had always wanted to do, so um, so I went for it. So, um, oh, getting ahead of myself here. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, the latest edition of my book. Uh, this, um, this is the cover called uh, Detroit, an Illustrated Timeline. This is the second edition of a book I wrote about three years ago for this publisher, Reedy Press, which is located in St. Louis, Missouri. They actually came to me with the idea for this book. They had done a similar book like this on St. Louis, which is their hometown. And the book is a, um, that book, as my book, is a series of vignettes of text. Each of one is maybe anywhere from two to 500 words long. And each describes a certain significant event in the history of their respective city. And what is noteworthy, and this is what I tried to do when I put the book together, is I wanted to put in things that where a, an event would build upon or grease the skids for a future event, which would build on that and which would continue in a pattern. So everything is kind of dependent on those things which happened earlier. And I tried to lay the book out in that manner. Um, about a year and a half ago, the publisher came to me and they said they wanted to do a second edition of the book. Um, a little bit shorter, soft cover, uh, and it has more of the highlights from the first book, but it also has a, few, a little bit of new material, too. One of the things I have in the back, uh, which I don't talk about in the presentation, is I have a, uh, an appendix of um, uh, significant works of Detroit area architecture, and there's got to be about at least 50 of them in there. Uh, putting that together was a lot of work in itself, because I thought, well, i got to put this in, and i got to put that, and I can't leave that out, so... I had to really kind of force myself to um, leave certain things out, but uh, I think you'll like that too. So, okay, so I'm going to go through these slides, and uh, this is a PowerPoint presentation. And I start, well, oh, this is a sensitive one. Uh, I started the, um, at the beginning, is it? I'm not sure. Okay, well, whatever. Um, this is um, the Detroit skyline at night. I took this picture, actually, I was standing underneath the Ambassador Bridge, and I was really, I, I do photography part-time too, and I was really enamored with the look of the, of the city skyline. So I took that and I put it right at the beginning. And then, of course, I go back very well to the beginning of Detroit. Now, as most of you may know, Detroit was founded in 1701. Uh, by Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac, who was a French explorer and who was um, si assigned by Louis XIV of France to set up a military outpost in between the upper and the lower Great Lakes for the purpose of keeping the British at bay. 
And the reason they were so interested in this area was because it was a key economic resource here, and that was the fur trade, which was quite lucrative at the time. There were markets for furs in both England and in France, so each, res each respective country wanted to have their claim on, on that resource. Um, the uh, British had a general presence in the lower Midwest, not so much in what's now Michigan, uh, but there was, of course, a lot of Native American presence here, too. As both British and French um, made settlements in this part of the New World, a lot of times they uh, formed alliances with the Native Americans, and the Native Americans, their loyalties would shift between the two, the British and the French, depending on who was giving them the best treatment, so to speak, um, or the most uh, advantageous um, uh, accommodations and such. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting about Detroit today is there are so many vestiges of the past in the physical layout of the city. And many of the um, major streets, because Detroit's laid out in like a hub and spoke uh, format, which is in keeping with the natu natural geography of the area, many of the major streets were actually one time Indian trails. And this map shows where some of those were. Um, Shiawassee Trail would be pretty much where Grand River is today. Uh, the Saginaw Trail pretty much parallels Woodward Avenue. And then the Great Salt Trail um, parallels uh, Michigan Avenue, uh, which um, uh, is later known as Chicago Road, and of course it goes all the way to Chicago. Um, the reason that that happened is because these Indian trails, because they were already established trails, were natural for European explorers to use first as um, uh, paths for horses, for horse pulled carriages, as um, uh, trade started to happen between the different, uh, between the different uh, European uh, colonies in this part of the country. And then of course, they later just developed into, organically into uh, streets and roads and so forth as the automotive era. Now, of course, on July 24, 1701, was when Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac landed in what is now Detroit. Um, his intention was to, uh, when he s uh, sailed down the Detroit River, uh, when he passed, first passed two days before this, the spot which later became Detroit, he noticed that there were a lot of predators on the, on the cliffs. There were bobcats, there were bears, and other dangerous animals. So. The expedition decided to go a little further down the river, and they camped that night on the island that we now call Grosseal, which of course is a residential neighborhood in the Detroit River. The next morning, they went further down the river still, and they noticed that there were a lot of islands, and the islands, of course, were an inhibition to visibility, uh, which from a military standpoint is, is very disadvantageous. So they turned around and came back to the area they were at the day before, uh, which is where Detroit is now. And there, other than Belle Isle, there were no islands there, so it was highly visible, and it was actually a little bit of a higher elevation, too. So they selected that spot for the, for the fort. Um, they landed on the 24th. Just two days later, on the 26th, was when the, uh, the crew started uh, uh, constructing the very first Catholic church. Most, if not all, of the, the uh, members of the expedition were Roman Catholic. And it was a French rich tradition to start a, a church as soon as they established a new, a new outpost. And uh, the, um, uh, the church that they established, the parish, was St. Anne. Uh, today, uh, the French name would be, be St. Anne de, de, de Trois. Uh, that parish still exists today. And if you um, cross from Canada um, by the Ambassador Bridge over the river, on the Detroit side, right by the bridge, there's a church with two twin spires, which is the present-day St. Anne's. Um, that church is the eighth church they've had in their history, and it was um, uh, it was built around 18, the 1870s, I believe. Uh, there were a succession of other smaller churches before that, most of which burned and, and, and uh, had to be quickly replaced. The very first St. Anne's only lasted a couple of years before it was burned by, uh, by some Indians. Uh, the records that were accumulated to that point were destroyed, but then they built a new church, they started a new registry, which dates to 1703. That registry still exists today, and it's still in the Archdiocesan Archives, and the baptism of Cadillac's daughter is the very first entry in it. Uh, 
Now, um, today, if you were in downtown Detroit, if you took East Jefferson from the Renaissance Center towards the Grosse Point area, you'll notice that, well, all around downtown, there's a lot of streets with French names. There's a, high concentra a higher concentration of them on that corridor of Jefferson. You'll have um, Louis Barr, you'll have Bovia, you'll have St. Aubin, you'll have other streets with, with French names. And the reason for that is because the French had a tradition, once French civilians came and they followed the, the military um, expedition, they established what they called ribbon farms on the riverfront. And this is kind of a, this map here shows you where some of them were. They were very, very narrow, and they would just uh, have a little bit of frontage on the waterfront where they could draw water from the river for irrigation. They would pipe that water upstream, or uphill, I should say, uh, for uh, crops. They would usually grow wheat, uh, soybeans, corn, and some other vegetables. Um, and that was the, kind of the French method for farming. The uh, farmers noticed that in that area, the soil was, it was very rich soil and it took to the crops easily. It was also very dark soil. And they called that area Black Bottom. Now, many, many, many years later in the 20th century, when African Americans were segregated to that part of the city, it was known as Black Bottom. The fact that African Americans were segregated there has nothing at all to do with the name. It was because the name had been given to that area about 200 years earlier by the French farmers for the reason I just mentioned. Uh, but the um, ribbon farms, as they formed, uh, would um, have a certain family's name on them. And if I can point one out right here, you'll see this is Rivard. And uh, right here is St. Jean. And today, if you go along Jefferson Avenue and you cross the intersections where those streets are, that means that's where the St. Jean family farm was, right, right there, for example. Now, there are many more farms than there are streets today because they were narrower, certainly, than modern-day city blocks would be. But that is a vestige from the, from the early 18th century. And the French presence continued in Detroit until about 1760, when the uh, French and Indian War, which was the North American counterpart to the Seven Years' War in, in Europe, uh, saw uh, British victories in several Midwestern forts. Uh, eventually, uh, the, um, the French surrendered, and New France basically was dissolved at that point. There were a couple of forts that were still in French hands. Detroit was one of them. But because the French had, had surrendered, uh, British, the British came in and occupied different, uh, different forts, one of which was Detroit. So that happened around 1760, and the British presence continued in Detroit uh, for about 20 years, until 1796. Now, if you, um, uh, um, one of the, uh, if you go downtown today, uh, right at uh, Capitol Park, Capitol Park is right at the corner of State Street and Griswold Street. That's called Capitol Park, but the word Capitol is spelled with an O, not an A. And the reason is because the Capitol building for Michigan was, was once located there. For the first 10 years of statehood, Detroit was the capital of Michigan before it moved to Lansing. And the uh, reason that the uh, Capitol was moved to Lansing was because I mentioned a moment ago that the British stayed until 1796. Well, of course, the United States declared independence 20 years earlier in 1776, but the British insisted on staying, and they finally st uh, finally left. Uh, then later on in the War of 1812, the British invaded from Canada again and stayed in Detroit for about a year. So when Michigan declared statehood in 1837, the idea was, well, there could be another British invasion. We've had a couple of them, so maybe we should move the capital to a more secure location. And that's why the original Constitution called for the capital to be moved after 10 years to a site to be chosen by the legislature. There were several cities around Michigan that were actually uh, candidates for the new capital. One of them was Ann Arbor. And um, Ann Arbor actually set aside a lot of land for state capital complex. Well, when Lansing was chosen instead, uh, Ann Arbor said to Detroit, uh, to the University of Michigan, which started in Detroit, well, we know you want to move out of Detroit. You might want to come here to Ann Arbor because we got all this land because the capital didn't come here. And that's why the University of Michigan is here in Ann Arbor. Uh, 
in um, um, not long after the uh, the British took over, there was a British uh, captain. His name was Richard Lerno. Despite the fact that he had a French name, he was actually British. And at that point, he wanted to construct a new fort. This is the riverfront. This is where the original fort was. And then he wanted to build a fort inland, which he named after himself as Fort Lerno. This fort, if you drive downtown today, Fort Street goes right through here, hence the name, and Shelby Street goes right here. And if you're familiar uh, with, with downtown, uh, the right about a block away from where the federal courthouse is on Fort Street, that's pretty much where this is right here today. And the, uh, the fort actually remained there until probably the 1830s when it was finally, finally demolished. But it was, uh, it was meant for security because to get it away from the riverfront and, and so forth. And by having it at a higher elevation, which it was, it was also thought to um, uh, provide a better defense against uh, uh, potential Indian attacks. Um, this is a document that describes uh, transactions between different parties who were interested in purchasing and selling slaves. Now, uh, we're tend we tend to think of slavery as associated with the American South, and that's certainly where it was the strongest. But um, the earlier, ba far further back you go, the more ubiquitous slavery was around the whole United States. And until 1825, there was slavery practiced in Detroit. It wasn't quite the same as the Southern model. Uh, there were, um, first of all, most of the slaves were Native Americans. They weren't African Americans. Uh, some of them were um, eventually granted their freedom. If they had children, the children weren't necessarily uh, assumed to be lifelong slaves. So it, there was there was some key distinctions, some key differences. But um, but and so, but some of the slaves were African American, and some of the leading prominent citizens of the era owned slaves. Uh, Louis Cass owned slaves. Uh, Joseph Campo um, and um, uh, William McComb all owned slaves. Cadillac himself actually owned a slave early in Detroit's history. He had one slave. And it was around in the 1820s when Michigan was first interested in becoming a state that um, slavery eventually was, was phased out here in Detroit. Um, at that time, in order for a state to be admitted to the Union, it, it, there had to be an equilibrium between free states and slave states you know, to um, maintain the balance of power in Congress. Uh, if Michigan had become a state then and admitted it as a slave state, that would have been one too many slave states, uh, and so it became a free state. It wanted to become a state after that, but then the balance on the slave side changed again, but then Arkansas became a, became a uh, which is a slave state, became part of the Union. That later cleared the way for Michigan to uh, be admitted. But before that could happen, in 1805, there was a fire that devastated the whole city. Now, at the time, Detroit, of course, was a very small town. It was all built out of wood. Uh, so it's um, not surprising that just a slight little spark or something could start a fire. Now, what happened, the story is, or the legend is, that there was a gentleman who was a baker, and he was getting ready for work one morning, and he was smoking a cigar, and the wind came along and blew some of the ashes off of his cigar, and some of the sparks hit a nearby pile of hay, and that ignited and, and, um, and the fire spread. There was kind of a bucket brigade that was hastily arranged, uh, a human chain that would get water from the river to try to douse the flames, but it turned out to be to be pretty futile, and almost everything in the city was destroyed at that point. And then after, after that happened, uh, there were really two individuals that were instrumental in Detroit's recovery after the fire. Uh, one of them was Gabriel Rochard, who was actually also one of the founders of the University of Michigan, uh, which was in Detroit at the time. 
Uh, but before that, he um, was uh, pastor of St. Anne's that I mentioned earlier. And he wrote a, um, a motto in French right after the um, right after the fire, translated in English, it reads, we hope for better things, it will arise again from the ashes. And that was meant to inspire the, the people towards helping to rebuild the city and uh, that better times would come, so it took a very optimistic look. That phrase is still the official motto of the city of Detroit today. And the other individual was Augustus Woodward. Now, Augustus Woodward was a judge in Washington who was sent uh, by uh, President Thomas Jefferson to Detroit to help revive the city after the fire. And one of the things he did was he drew up a new street grid for the city. Now, the grid was well suited for 19th century horse traffic, not so much for 20th century automotive traffic, of course. And uh, what he wanted to do was take a concept that, is, that was already in use in Washington, D.C., which uh, the French explorer Pierre Lafont had adopted from the plan, the, the way that Paris was planned out. And that's where you would have a series of large traffic circles, like up here, and then streets would radiate out in different directions that would create blocks that were triangular or trapezoidal or what have you. And it would be um, uh, thought to be very aesthetically appealing. And for, for 20, uh, 19th century traffic, which was reliant not only on horses but on pedestrian traffic, it actually was, um, was quite, um, quite interesting. Uh, then what would happen was, well, the way that Woodward uh, envisioned it is, he saw that like a circle, as this, the city grew, this whole pattern could be repeated indefinitely, and that all the streets would eventually converge on one grand circle, or grand circus, as, as Grand Circus Park is known. Now, if you go downtown today, you'll notice that Grand Circus Park is only a semicircle; it's not a full circle. The reason for that is because north of Adams Street here, there were farmers that owned the land there, and they didn't want different roads going in odd directions through their properties so, so, so they would um, hamper the planting of their crops so they uh, wouldn't cooperate. So the streets up there today are arranged in traditional blocks. But this part really exists. Down here, this is pretty much where Campus Martius is today. In fact, it is. This is Campus Martius. Uh, south of Campus Martius, you'll see Monroe. And this this doesn't exist. These are blocks here and right down to Jefferson. Um, but what you see here is actually um, the, way it was, uh, the way it was implemented. Uh, some of the streets have different names. Uh, Miami Avenue is um, Broadway and uh, Macomb Avenue is uh, Clifford, I believe. And um, so there's, there's that as well. Um, the um, south of Jefferson, you see some of these blocks here. This was pretty much where Hart Plaza is today, and you'll see different um, uh, warehouse blocks and that sort of thing. The coastline, the shoreline is right here. Now you'll see how some of these, the plan for some streets was off the shore in the water, and that's because there was a lot of landfill that was done after that uh, there today. The, the river was much wider in Cadillac's day than it is today. Um, in, um, in the, uh, the modern day. Most of what you see in Hart Plaza is landfill. It's also true on Belle Isle, too. Uh, the Sunset Point, which is like the southern tip of Belle Isle, that's all land where Scott Fountain is. That's all landfill. That wasn't originally there. And this is the Second Baptist Church on Monroe Street in, uh, in Greektown. Um, Second Baptist is noteworthy because, um, well, it was founded in the 1830s by some former slaves. Uh, they wanted to worship at the First Baptist Church in Detroit, but uh, that was pretty much an all-white church, and they were discriminated against. So they said, well, we'll just start our own, and they called it the Second Baptist Church. Uh, the First Baptist Church still exists today, by the way. It's in Southfield. Uh, but the Second Baptist Church on Monroe is... Um, just about any African-American Baptist church in southeast Michigan trace, can trace its heritage to Second Baptist. There would be members that maybe moved a little uh, further away and formed a, a separate congregation, and then another generation after that, some 
some of their descendants moved further away and formed another congregation and that sort of thing. And that repeated several times. But uh, going back to the 19th century, just about every African American Baptist church in the Detroit area, as I said, can trace its heritage to Second Baptist. In the basement, there is a um, museum to the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad, of course, was a network of safe houses that protected escaped slaves that came from the South. Uh, there were a number of them downtown. One of them was in the basement of Second Baptist. Uh, the, the building right here that you see today was built around, I think, 1914 or so. So it wasn't the one that was there during the Civil War, but it was on the very, very same spot. And nearby is, um, this is the original home of Temple Bethel. Now, Temple Bethel uh, was started in 1850. It was at the corner of St. Antoine and um, Lafayette Streets. And uh, there were, at the time, there were about maybe 12 Jewish families in Detroit around 1850, and they didn't have a temple of their own. So they decided to meet at the home of a, um, John and Sarah Cousins. Now their last name was spelled C-O-Z-E-N-S. Not, you might hear of uh, James Cousins who was later the mayor of Detroit. That was spelled with a U. That was spelled differently. It was a different family. But the, the Cousins family that started Temple Bethel, uh, the, um, the very first services were held in their house. And then later on they branched, they branched out to a different uh, rented uh, headquarters, rented quarters and and that sort of thing. Eventually, they built their own temple, but that wasn't until, oh, probably 75 years later. The building on Woodward that is, uh, until recently, was the Bonstell Theater, operated by Wayne State. That was the first Temple Bethel that was actually built as a dedicated synagogue. It was designed by Albert Kahn. Uh, but between this and then, there were several different temporary uh, quarters and so forth. Uh, when Temple Bethel first started, it was a very, very traditional form of Judaism. Their worship uh, uh, very, very much in the Orthodox mode. After about 20 years, a new rabbi came in and decided to embrace the Reform tradition, which was taking root in Germany at the time, which used the vernacular. Uh, they didn't um, use uh, uh, some of the uh, traditional prayer shawls. Uh, some of the men didn't have to wear yarmulkes. And there were a few other more uh, liberal changes that were made. Well, that was not accepted by some families in the congregation, so they went off and formed their own synagogue. The one they formed was uh, Congregation Sherat Zedek, which also exists today still. Uh, not today, uh, Temple Bethel and Sherat Zedek are actually kind of close to each other in the Southfield area. Uh, Temple Bethel is located at 14 Mile and Telegraph and Sherrod Zedek is on the Northwestern Service Drive right near Telegraph Road. Uh, they both have very large modern structures. Uh, Temple Bethel, the current one, was designed by the Japanese architect Miro Yamasaki. I like this one because um, a lot of times when you'll see old pictures of downtown Detroit, typically what you'll see is older buildings that don't exist today anymore. And that's true here, except for this. This is the Michigan Soldiers and Sailors Monument. And it's, I think it's probably the oldest structure of any type in downtown Detroit today. Um, when the Civil War started in 1861, um, there was no military conscription at the time. Uh, the regular army was quite small, so President Lincoln asked for volunteers to help augment the federal forces to put down the Southern Rebellion. Um, the legend has it that Michigan was the first northern state to respond. And as different companies arrived in uh, Detroit, and they met right here at Campus Martius, which you see in the, in the uh, picture, uh, they um, then shipped out to Washington, D.C. When they arrived in Washington, President Lincoln is uh, alleged to have said, thank God for Michigan. Uh, most people on both sides thought that the war would be a relatively short affair. When it turned out not to be, uh, then it was obvious that um, uh, some, unfortunately, some Michigan guys, and for other northern states too, would not be coming home. 
So the decision was made by some local leaders to construct a monument to honor their sacrifice. And the gentleman who uh, won the design competition was actually from Ann Arbor here. His name was Randolph Rogers. And he uh, came up with this pyramid type design with setbacks that was very common design for memorials in the 19th century. Uh, there are memorial, there's sculptures here that represent the different branches of the 19th century military asset that they did. Uh, and it's, it's there today and it's been cleaned up and it's, uh, it's uh, most, most people are like it. I, I kind of love it myself. And this is a cover from the dedication that uh, took place on April 9th of 1872. That date is significant because that was the seventh anniversary of Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse that effectively ended the Civil War. Uh, the uh, cornerstone had been laid several years before that in, in 1867. Uh, there's something interesting about this picture. You will notice that these are the male figures I was talking about. The female figures are right here, but they're not in the picture, they're absent. The reason for that is because by the time they had finished the monument or were ready to dedicate it, they had run out of money and they couldn't finish. They didn't have uh, the money to, to um, uh, commission the remaining figures. Later on they did, and that's why they're there today, but in the spirit of honesty, uh, they didn't want to put them in the picture on the cover of the program. They wanted to show it the way it is, so I give them kudos for that. And this is the David Whitney residence. This is on Woodward Avenue. Now, if you're familiar with the way Woodward is today, it's amazing here because it looks like such a narrow, quiet residential street, which I guess it was at the time. Um, but uh, this was um, uh, commissioned by David Whitney in the early 1890s. He was a um, he was a, a lumber baron. He wasn't from Michigan. He was from Boston. Uh, and he was already quite wealthy when he was there, but there were um, new business opportunities here in Michigan. There were a lot of um, forests being uh, uh, felled up in northern Michigan, and there was a lot of um, lumber being generated from that. He wanted to um, be a part of that, so he moved his family to Detroit. After a few years, his wife wanted him to build a new home for the family that would represent their station in life. You know, in that. That was their the prevailing attitude at the time. So he commissioned this house. Um, this is a black and white picture, but if you go there today, you know, today it's a restaurant. It's a very nice restaurant. Uh, but the building is sheathed in something called pink jasper stone. It was quarried in South Dakota. It's extremely, extremely hard. And when they were constructing the building in order to get the, the stone to be cut to the proper dimensions, uh, the tradesmen their tools kept burning out because of the um, because the stone was so hard they actually had to set up a temporary blacksmith shop in the back just to replenish the tools uh, on a continual basis the building in other respects is very over engineered uh, there are um, hardwood floors that are like three or four inches thick uh, when they poured the concrete for the driveway they poured it like five feet thick and I don't know why they did that but uh, uh, but of course um, David Whitney, he died in the house in 1900, and his ghost is said to inhabit the house today. Uh, the restaurant that's in there today, they kind of capitalize on that in their marketing, and the bar that's on the third floor, they call it the Ghost Bar. Um, I wrote a book, in fact, I have it back here, on uh, restaurants of Detroit, most of which are defunct, but not this one. And one of the things that I found out when I interviewed the owner was that he told me that uh, he had a bartender working for him up there who uh, one night uh, was waiting on a customer and out of the corner of his eye on his right, it's right by the staircase, there was an, another couple coming up the stairs and they went to an adjacent room. Well, when he finished with his customer, he walked into the other room to see if these other people wanted a drink or whatever and he walks into the room and it's empty, there's no one there. And that was the last of several similar incidents that this young man had gone through. So he tendered his resignation because of that. He was, he was just too scared. Uh, there was another story about a staff member that went up to uh, an older man looking out the window one night, and it was close to closing time, so he was gonna 
asked him politely if it was time to leave. Well, the man turned and he bore a striking resemblance to David Whitney. And right after that, he disappeared into the floor. So, um, it's all interesting. Um, personally, I don't believe in those things, but, but some people do. And uh, it's, so it's an interesting thing to, to explore or whatever if you want to go there. It's an outstanding restaurant, by the way. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They actually, you know what? They have on the second floor, they have some a place where you can go and just to have dessert. They have like a dessert bar on the second floor, and you don't have to have reservations to go there. Too. So. And it was in the very, very late, the last few years of the 19th century, when the automotive industry took hold. I have another book I wrote here, in fact, I have it over there, on the development of the auto industry here in Detroit. Now, I say in Detroit because the first cars really weren't invented here. Um, the earliest automotive technology was developed in Europe, specifically in Germany. Um, but um, there were also a lot of uh, innovators and tinkerers here. It's always an interesting question, why did the American auto industry take hold and develop in Detroit? Why didn't it happen in Chicago or Cleveland or Buffalo or some other place? And the reason is not entirely clear. However, it's, while all those cities had raw material, they had cap investment capital, they had rail transit, water transit, they had a lot of the necessary ingredients. Ultimately, it came down to just serendipity because we had some innovators here that were just creative thinkers and they just happened to be from here. Henry Ford ran some holds. Um, John Horace Dodge, well, they weren't from here, but they moved here from south, um, Western Michigan when they were young men. And uh, these individuals just basically worked together. Uh, they were kind of drawn to each other because of their shared interests and passions. And that's really what gave rise to it here. Uh, this is the first factory of Ford Motor Company. Uh, Ford Motor Company, as it exists today, was actually Henry Ford's third attempt to be an auto manufacturer. His first two ended in failure. And the first one was a, a company called the Detroit Automotive Company. The Detroit Automotive Company um, um, hired Henry Ford to design and market a car. Well, Henry Ford's work habits were rather lackadaisical for to be polite. Uh, he was working on a race car on the side, so he really didn't do what he was supposed to do during the day a whole lot. And uh, the outfit only lasted less than a year, and then it dissolved, and, and he was fired. Well, some of the investors wanted to give him another chance, so they started another company called the Henry Ford Company. And they figured if they put his name on it, that might stroke his ego. Well, unfortunately, the same thing happened again. And he was, um, he had come up with a rudimentary design, and the investors said, I'll tell you what, we'll give you the rights to your design and $200 in cash if you'll do us the favor of just going away. So, okay. Well, after that, they called in Henry Leland, who later founded Lincoln Motors, uh, to come in and appraise the shop just for liquidation purposes. And he did, and he said, well, you know, I'll do it, but I'll tell you, I think you should really, I think you got something going here. I think you should keep on with the venture. I'll be able to come and be your chief engineer. And he had actually invented a four-cylinder engine at that point, which he brought with him. So they took him up on it, and that company became Cadillac. And then Cadillac, of course, later became the luxury caps of General Motors, but Cadillac actually started as the Henry Ford Company. Um, this was the first, and then after that, Henry Ford entered his race car, which he had perfected in a race at a place called the Gross Point Racetrack. It wasn't in present-day Gross Point, it was in the present-day east side of Detroit. Um, against all odds, he won the race. He had hired a, a driver to drive the car for him. And there were investors in the audience that gave him yet another chance. One of them was a man named Alexander Malcolmson, who was a coal merchant in Detroit. He bankrolled a partnership called Ford and Malcolmson. They started working on another car design. Uh, the Dodge brothers were one of their suppliers for transmissions and engines. They fell on behind on their payments to the Dodge brothers. They were getting rather upset. Malcolmson gets the idea, well, let's incorporate, attract more investors, 
and then um, we should be able to make a go of it. Well, they did that, and um, the Dodge brothers were asked to forgive $7,000 in past due balances and kick in an additional $3,000 in cash. Well, this is in 1903. You can imagine what $10,000 is like in 1903. Well, they did it, and they got 10% of the stock in the new company um, in return. There were 12 other would-be investors that uh, all came and contributed their funds to the new venture, too. I say 12, but only 11 of them were accepted, because the 12th one would have been the 13th when you count the Dodge Brothers, too. And Henry Ford was superstitious, and he wouldn't allow a 13th investor. So um, their first factory was this building on Mack Avenue. Uh, it's not there today. Uh, it was a rented building. They were there for less than a year. Uh, if you go to Greenfield Village today, there's a one-third size replica of this building. Uh, after they moved out of here, they moved into the Paquette, Paquette plant on Paquette Street in Detroit. That plant is still there. It's a museum today. And um, they had uh, sold their first car finally to a doctor in Chicago, the first Model A. By the time they had made their first sale, all the funds that had been invested had dwindled to a mere $200. Uh, but that first sale happened and then the rest is history, so to say. They had made profits of almost $37,000 in a couple of months. So in 1919, many years later, when Henry Ford wanted to take his company private again, he bought the stock of all the outstanding stockholders the $10,000 investment that the Dodge Brothers had put in by then was valued at $25 billion. Pretty astounding. And uh, this is a new, this was not in the first edition, this is in the uh, second edition of the book. Uh, this is a, a piece of uh, marketing ephemera from uh, Packard Motor Company. Now, Packard, you might think of as the um, plant on the east side of Detroit that's in the process of being torn down. Oh, thanks for the And um, Packard started, and actually not in Detroit, but in Warren, Ohio. Uh, oh. um, Packard started in Warren, Ohio. And, um, around 1902. And the reason it started was because there was a gentleman who was John Ward Packard, uh, who had heard about a company in Cleveland that was building cars, which were a real novelty at the time. The name of the company was called the Winton Company. So Packard goes to Cleveland to take delivery on his Winton car. And as he's driving back to, um, to uh, uh, Warren, the car broke down several times en route. And then when he had a chance to express his displeasure to Mr. Winton, he copped an attitude and he says, well, if you're so smart, Mr. Packard, why don't you design your own car? So he said, okay, I'll do it. And um, the rest of the history, it became really the capstone of, of luxury. Um, uh, after a couple years, uh, Henry Joy, who was a businessman in Detroit, was in New York one day, and he saw a car on the street that he thought was really, really interesting. And he was impressed by the quality and the performance and so forth. He asked the driver, what kind of car is that? He says, well, it's a Packard. They're built in Warren, Ohio. So he was so enamored with it, he actually went to uh, Warren and actually met with, the, with Packard and his brother. There were two Packard brothers. And he wanted to invest in the company and uh, move it to Detroit. So they were for it. Um, they got to keep their jobs, and uh, so they moved to Detroit with the company, and it was, um, um, it uh, set the standard for luxury for many, many years. Really, up until World War II, uh, Packard exceeded even Cadillac as far as um, the, quality, the standard in, in luxury automobiles. It contrasted sharply with Ford, because Ford wanted to design a car for the everyday man uh, that would, um, if um, an owner had even just basic mechanical skills, he would be able to service it himself. That's what Henry Ford passionately believed in. The Packard brothers were the total opposite of that. They wanted just to cater to the very, very high-end uh, corner of the market. And they did it very, very well. Um, during World War II, um, I'll talk about that in a minute, but there were many, really all Detroit automakers um, were very, very um, 
uh, enthusiastic supporters of the war effort. Um, they, would, they were required to by the government, but they would have done it otherwise, I'm sure. Uh, Packard made uh, engines that were actually Rolls-Royce design engines for the P-51 Mustang. Uh, the engines were sent to um, England, where the final assembly would happen with the planes. Now, um, as the auto industry prospered uh, throughout the 20s, the teens and the 20s, um, Henry Ford, um, before any of this happened, was really um, to be credited because around 1910 is when he decided to pay his workers $5 a day, which was about double the prevailing wage at the time. Prior to that, the relationship between most employees, workers in any industry, and their bosses was one of total subservience, and it was a holdover from the whole Gilded Age of the 19th century, uh, where workers were just like, almost like possessions. Well, Henry Ford changed the relationship between an employer and an employee uh, by paying them a, a decent wage. One of the reasons he did it was he wanted his people to be actually be able to afford one of the cars that they were building. Uh, which happened, and uh, it's argued, too, that it opened the whole modern consumer economy. There was even a name for it called Fordism. Well, by the 1920s, and certainly after the stock market crash and the Depression in the 30s began, much of that goodwill had evaporated. Um, organized labor had started. In 1937, the UAW staged the famous sit-down strike at uh, GM plant Flint, which uh, led ultimately to the recognition of the UAW by GM. Walter Ruther, who is the gentleman in the center of the picture with the, gold, the watch chain there, he wanted to um, organize Ford to, he, would know, he knew it would be a much, much harder task. Uh, but one day, he came with some volunteers to the Ford Rouge complex in Dearborn uh, to pass out leaflets to interested workers, either going into work or getting off their shift. And he invented, invited the media with him. And one of them was a photographer from the Detroit News. His name was James Kilpatrick. And they were just minding their own business, basically. They went on this overpass over Miller Road. And, that, and the reason is you can see that Ford Motor Company sign on the building as a backdrop. And Kilpatrick thought it would make for good pictures, which it, which it did. So he's taking pictures, and then all of a sudden these guys on the left-hand side of the picture show up. They were called the uh, euphemistically named service department at Ford Motor Company. In reality, they were just a goon squad that would uh, viciously attack anyone that would even hint at a union. Well, seconds after this picture was taken, they were savagely beaten by these guys. Um, Walter Ruther himself was pushed down about three flights of concrete steps and then, and then kicked afterwards. Uh, how they survived is, is amazing. And then after that, they went to the media people and they took their notebooks, they smashed cameras, exposed film, you name it, except for Kilpatrick. For some reason, nobody noticed him and he slipped away from there, took the steps down to street level. He had a driver working for him. He gets in the car and he says, let's get out of here. They drive away, and then they get stopped by a Ford security guard who demands the photographic plates. And he hands them over, but there were blanks. He had taken the real ones and hit him under the seat. They get back downtown and uh, show them to the editors. They develop them, and they run them. And within a couple of days, these pictures were all over the world. And it severely damaged Ford Motor Company's reputation. It wouldn't actually result in the company recognizing the union for several years later. It wasn't until 1941. Ford was the last one. Ford himself, Henry Ford, said that he would close the company down. He would never, ever, ever, ever recognize the UAW until his wife said she would leave him if he didn't. And that changed his mind. <laughs> And um, one other thing about that picture, too. At the time that picture was taken, um, there was no Pulitzer Prize for photography. That picture inspired its creation. Um, around the same time in the 30s, of course, with the Depression going on, um, 
it unleashed a lot of political extremes. Of course, we know the rise of fascism in Europe, particularly in Germany, but there, were political, there was political extremism here in the United States also. And one exponent of that here in Michigan was this man. He was a Catholic priest. His name was Father Charles Coughlin. He was pastor of the Shrine of the Little Flower Church in Royal Oak. Now, when he first formed that parish, it was still in the 1920s, he got the idea of broadcasting the services as a fundraiser, you know, and, and it, it was purely religious at first. But then when the Depression started, he started um, broadcasting his sermons. He at first endorsed Franklin Roosevelt for the presidency, but then as things went on and um, the Depression worsened, Coughlin thought that Roosevelt wasn't doing enough. He had a falling out with him. Coughlin fell into the trap of political extremism himself. He started um, embracing those who scapegoated certain groups, particularly Jewish people. Coughlin was known for his anti-Semitism. Church authorities were very, very nervous. Eventually, they ordered him off the air. But at the same time, Coughlin was publishing a newspaper that amplified many of the things he said in his radio sermons. And by 1942, he was told that the U.S. Justice Department was going to indict him for sedition if he didn't stop publishing his paper. And that, and only that, forced him to stop. He, had already, he was already off the radio by then. But um, after that, he just reverted basically to the role of a simple parish priest. He retired in the mid-1960s. And uh, he died in 1979. Um, I know a lot about him because when I was a kid growing up, we actually lived in Royal Oak, and I remember hearing him speak. When I was an infant, I was baptized by him. And, of course, during the war, uh, as I said earlier, um, the automotive industry was largely devoted to, um, they didn't make any any civilian cars at all after Jane and right after the Pearl Harbor invasion. But even before that, it was obvious that the war was coming, and President Roosevelt hired, or actually asked, asked, a gentleman who was uh, an executive at GM at the time named William Knudsen uh, to head up the war production board. Uh, he did that, and one of the things that he realized that we needed most was air power. Um, the United States Armed Forces were pathetically small at the time. They were smaller than Portugal or something. So um, this particular design of a B-24 bomber was done by a company in San Diego, California called Consolidated. And Knudsen asked uh, Ford Motor Company to go out there and look at that plane design and see if they could mass produce it. Well. Edsel Ford and uh, Charles Sorensen, his production chief, they went out to California. They saw they were impressed with the plane, but the but the production methods there were very primitive. They assembled them by hand, and you know they couldn't get any any um, efficiency. So Sorensen came up with the idea of building a plane on an assembly line, just like you would build a car. Well, that had never been done before, but um, they came up with the design for it. Uh, Edsel Ford approved the construction of a new plant. It was in Ypsilanti, not far from here. It was like five million square feet. It was just a mammoth plant. Most of it was torn down recently. There's still a little bit of it left. And um, the, um, the plant was finished like right around the time Pearl Harbor happened. And when they started production, it was slow at first because the government was always designing, demanding these design changes, and there was all kinds of um, uh, problems with uh, staffing and with retention. Uh, a lot of the men were already in the military at the time, so uh, it was it was it was a very it was a big challenge. But by 1944, they had gotten to the point where they were producing one of these planes per hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it was just a, a miracle of mass production. And of course. Um, this is not really a local story, but I put it in here because when, in August of 1945, when the war ended, that was a international event, a national event, and also here, a local event. Because most of the time when we talk about how changes happened in the city, 
Uh, we use world, the end of World War II as the yardstick. Things that happened before the war, things that happened after the war, and so forth. Um, and I'll talk about some of the other the post-war things in a minute. But there were so many um, changes that, that happened. And the, one of the questions I talk about in the book, and I always wondered this myself, when, right at the moment, when the time when the war ended, people obviously were very happy. But I wonder if they ever thought themselves about what was going to happen after that. Would we be the same place? Would we be the same nation? How would we change? I've, uh, I've never really been able to interview anybody from that time that thought if they thought anything or if things were just going to continue the way they had or what have you. I, something, a question I've always, I've always wondered about. And of course, one of them was shopping malls. And um, in um, the late 40s, uh, there was a, a Jewish refugee from Austria. Uh, his name was Victor Grun, who was an architect. He went to the executives at J.L. Hudson Company and proposed that they open new satellite stores in the suburbs with directional names, Northland, Eastland, Southland, and Westland. And at first they didn't want to do it, but um, a couple years later they changed their minds, and by 1954, the first one, Northland, was uh, completed. And, of course, the um, shopping malls have kind of an interesting history. They were such a big thing at first, and then until, and really until maybe the last 10 or 15 years, now, of course, online shopping has replaced shopping malls for a large extent. Um, out of the four original Hudson shopping centers in the suburbs, uh, two are now closed. Northland is now being redeveloped. I live just about a couple blocks from Northland, so I know where it is. Uh, I can see how it's changing. There's apartments going up in what used to be the parking lot. And the mall itself is going to be, uh, I think, some office space and some retail, too. So it's interesting to see what's happening there. Uh, the sculpture you see right there is uh, a famous sculpture by uh, Marshall Fredericks, uh, the sculptor. It's uh, called uh, Boy and uh, Bear. That today is located on the campus at uh, Saginaw Valley State University in Saginaw. They actually have a, a museum there dedicated to Marshall Fredericks' work. Of course, expressways was another thing, too. Uh, one of the big differences between expressways in Detroit and other cities is other cities, there are expressways, they build expressways, too, but they integrated usually into mass transit systems, subways, commuter rail, etc. That didn't happen. And uh, we just had pretty much just expressways for cars exclusively and um, because we built cars. Uh, <laughs> I think that was it. And... Um, uh, it certainly had some pretty conveniences, but it, it certainly had a lot of bad effects. And uh, socially, there were a lot of changes then, too, most of which was related to um, uh, population shifts and changing racial attitudes. Uh, there was, with the, in the post-war era, there was a growing recognition of the rights of African Americans, but it was a very slow, painful evolution. For much of the time, there was a hostile white population that resisted much of what happened. Uh, one of the things was, this is in 1963, there was a resolution that was put before Detroit Common Council to prohibit racial discrimination in real estate sales. Well, unfortunately, as you can see by the headline, that failed 7 to 2. Um, Detroit, it's a funny thing, Detroit at the time had a reputation of being a very liberal city. Um, two years earlier, they had elected Jerry Kavanaugh as uh, a very liberal Democratic mayor. But the city council was still reflective of the opinion of uh, what was called a, a blind pig, which was a uh, kind of a 1960s version of a 1930s speakeasy, uh, an unlicensed drinking establishment. Uh, there was there was a, um, a blind pig on the west side of the city that um, there were some people there that were celebrating the safe return of two young men from Vietnam when uh, a police vice squad on a very early Sunday morning of uh, July 23rd raided the place and because it was unlicensed, of course, they decided to arrest everyone there even though there were more people than they expected. There were like 80 people there, but they did it nonetheless. 
uh, a crowd gathered and saw all the patrons being taken away, and somebody threw a rock, and that sparked the whole uh, the whole incident, which lasted for several days. It was the worst um, uh, civil insurrection in the 20th century uh, up until that time. Um, what's interesting, too, and I found this out recently, is the same vice squad that did this earlier that evening, that very same evening, they had ra- they had raided about two other blind pigs without incident. And this is another shot. This is 12-3, and you can see how the fire was uh, fire was pretty uncontrollable. One of the problems the firefighters had is oftentimes they were attacked they were, uh, by uh, rock throwing and bottle throwing while they were trying to fight a fire. So that made it even more difficult. But we've seen a lot, and um, this is where I end the presentation pretty much. Um, this is a view down Woodward. Uh, I take this almost in a symbolic way because usually when you see a photograph of downtown Detroit, you see it from the Windsor side and you see the river and so forth. This is the uh, this is from the other direction, and you're looking back. And um, uh, this is right from the area around uh, what they call the District of Detroit now. The building on the right hand side that's the uh, Lake Village School of Business, part of Wayne State. And there's a lot happening now, and it's not just downtown. I mean, I'm a realist, and I realize that there's poverty and more with social problems, especially with education in many parts of the city. But the revival that's happening in Detroit today isn't just downtown. It's in many other parts of the city, too. And there is a certain long-term permanence to it. Uh, I've seen that myself. I drive around the city a lot. I do, I'm a tour guide part-time, too, and I do the tours parts of the city, and I see what's happening, and uh, while the total, the population decline has probably been arrested at this point, uh, it's a huge decline, Detroit was about 1.8 million in 1950, now it's about 650,000, uh, but there's still something happening that I think is, is tangible and real, and something I think we should all be very, very uh, proud of. This is uh, what they call the District of Detroit is that, that's the name that the OH organizations have given to this this neighborhood, District Detroit, by the OH organization. Yeah, that's what they call it. They call it. The, it's a marketing name they came up with. It's not really a neighborhood, um, but it's on Woodward Avenue, looking south towards downtown. Um, Little Caesars Arena is like right here, and uh, back this way, there's. Uh, developments, they haven't progressed at the rate they really should have, uh, but uh, there's still promise and hope in that regard, too. But then there's mega developers that are doing other big work, too. Dan Gilbert is the obvious one, but there's a lot of smaller developers that are doing things, too, that you don't hear a whole lot about. The Roxbury group is one. Uh, there, there's other things, too, and I think that it's important that we pay attention to those things and, and see them for what they are. Ford Motor Company, of course, with the development of the Michigan Central Station, is, uh, is an enormous, uh, enormous thing. Um, Amtrak would actually like to uh, revive train travel uh, service to the station. Uh, if they could run a line from Chicago, right past Ann Arbor here, down to Dearborn, to downtown Detroit, and then over to Toronto. There's a tunnel under the river, a railway tunnel that they use. And it's, um, it would be a, a really a great, great step forward if that were to happen. Any other questions? Okay. Anybody else? Oh. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. I have copies of my book here that I, I, I have a little table set up at here if you're interested. I have uh, t- a few of my other books here, too, including my automotive book, which uh, you might want to take a look at, too. And um, I'll be happy to sign them for you if you're interested. So thank you so much for having me here. And uh, um, I, this is a little unusual. Usually when I do talks related to my books, I don't travel as far as Ann Arbor. But uh, I love this place, and it's a great place to come. I'm really glad to have met you. So thank you so much for having me.